Many thanks, David. I think your, uh, your thoughts, uh, your comments on your wise counsel are compelling evidence that things of excellence are well worth repeating. So thank you. Um, we're going to change pace now. Uh, we're going to stretch your minds a little bit uh, before you get to coffee and to give you something to speak about over coffee. Um, the more observant amongst you will have noticed that in the, in the program we have today, we're basically structuring each, ses each session with a challenge from an external speaker to th throw down a challenge, make us think, uh, give us some wake-up calls and so on. So when we, when we move into the, uh, as we begin to look at the future now, um, we thought nothing better than to have one of the uh, world's most renowned futurists. Now, I just love the concept of futurist. I would, I would like that in my job title. You know, I think it should be Canso Director General and Futurist. It's just a great concept. Um, but I can, I can promise you that uh, um, our, our, our speaker is a, a well-known speaker in great demand around the world and will certainly uh, stretch your minds and, and set some challenges for us. So with no more from me, I'd like to introduce uh, Rohit Talwar. <laughs> Still want me to do the full hour? Sorry, just, just do the full hour. Yeah. Okay. yeah, thanks. Well, good morning. And uh, firstly, thank you all to, for inviting me here today. Uh, and I hope you still feel that way at the end of my speech. Um, <clears throat> my role in the next hour is really to get you to take a step back from the day to day, from your current challenges, from the issues you're facing, and really reflect on the context in which you deliver the kind of transformation that all of our speakers this morning have talked about. What's going on in the outside world that's going to shape the environment in which you deliver these changes? And what are the mechanisms by which you might deliver those changes? One of the things that's really interesting for me is uh, we, we work with CEOs and, and executive teams in a range of different industries, helping them think about the future, how they respond to the future, but also how they create the future. Recently, we've been working with one of the world's leading airlines and one of the major airport companies to develop their sort of 2030 to 2050 visions. What was fascinating to me was, in both cases, not once did they incorporate ATM in any of the factors that they needed to take into account. And, and we asked in both cases why that was. And they said, well, there's probably five different ways in which it will be replaced from its current model. Uh, and it will be built into the environment rather than a separate feature of it. So what we already know is your customers have views about where they're going. The people you work with in the ecosystem have views. So my challenge to you is to really think about how do we accelerate the kind of changes we need to make? What are the levers we can pull to make sure it happens quickly and that we're not left behind by changes happening around us in the world and by the kind of economic forces and pressures that are coming? So we can get the slides up. Uh, a little bit of explanation about what we do. We spend our time uh, researching the future, exploring how technology, how science, how economics could change in the next five to 50 years. We've just finished a project for the European Commission looking at the science and technology that will shape the world to 2050. Um, we also work with leadership teams to help them envision, envision the future. And we work with a lot of people who are starting out in their sectors saying, how do you change the game? How do you transform the industry? And I think that is probably one of the biggest challenges we face today, is that literally every sector in the world, from governments to commercial companies, are being faced with this challenge that they have to rethink who they are and what they do. Because for decades now, they've played by a certain set of rules. And then along comes somebody who says, actually, we're going to challenge that. We're not going to just play by your rules. We're going to reinvent the rules. We're going to reinvent the game, which means you're left behind. You look in the mobile phone world. Nokia was recently sold for 40% of its revenues to Microsoft. BlackBerry, or the makers of BlackBerry, who are called RIM, were valued at $70 billion a few years ago. They couldn't sell themselves recently for less than $2 billion. Now, most of us are sick of hearing that we're in a mobile world that there's a mobile revolution going on. Yet two of the people who bought us that revolution barely gave themselves away or couldn't give themselves away. Why? Because along came Apple and changed the game about what telephony was, mobile phones were about. It was no longer about technical excellence. It was about the user experience. 
It was about creating a design that the customer wanted. It was around creating an experience that the customer wanted at a price point roughly five times that of what Nokia was charging and completely changed the game. And we're seeing that in every sector. Possibly the sector where we're going to see the biggest change is at the level of competition between governments and governments changing the way the game is played in terms of international competition. Recently, Nigeria doubled the size of its economy by including all sorts of other factors, mainly the informal economy. The informal economy is now 57% of Nigeria's economy, the estimates suggest. But they have doubled the competition. Overnight, they became Africa's largest economy just by changing the game, by changing what you measure and how you look at your economy. The UK this year is including prostitution and drug dealing in the measurement of our economy. Now, our National Statistics Office says that will grow our economy by 10 billion pounds, about 5 billion of which is drug dealing. I live in a place called Kilburn in North London. They only have to come and stand outside the local tube station, and that's about the average revenue you see in drug dealing outside the station on a good weekend. So we know that actually that's probably a, a very significant underestimate. But we're going to see more and more of this. We're going to see people merging economies. We, we've done a lot of analysis on behalf of some governments and on behalf of some commercial corporations to say, which are the countries most likely to merge in the next 20 years or give themselves over to management by a larger company, co uh, country because they simply cannot afford to run their economy. They, cannot have, they haven't got the skill sets to do it going forward in a more complex world. And we've identified between 20 and 40 countries that we think effectively won't, will no longer exist as sovereign states within the next 20 years. In all but name, they might still be there, but everything else will be done by someone else, either by a commercial company running the, you know, their infrastructure, running their administration, or they'll have handed themselves over to a larger entity to do it, because they simply won't be able to afford to do it and to keep pace with the changing world. So in that context, the question for you is, how big is the change going to be for you? Are you changing within the rules of the game, or do you need to rethink the game itself? We also know that the environment you operate in is under real stress. Uh, the airline industry, in its history, if you add up its profits and its losses, it's made a net loss. It, you know, it's a good year when they make a profit. It's not a typical year when they make a profit. We also know now that ACI tell us that 70% of all the airports around the world are losing money. That can't make sense. You're operating in an ecosystem where they don't know how to make a profit on a continuous basis. They don't know how to manage their own survival, which means there are real pressures coming. We did some work um, 18 months ago on how you reinvent airports for the world we're moving into, because one of the things we could see was there was a lot of very disjointed thinking that happens in airports. On the one hand, their role may be to be just a bus stop, literally a place where you get in and out as quickly as possible. But on the other hand, they're trying to provide the kind of infrastructure that you'd find in a major hub. The two are inconsistent because you can't finance it. And what we see more and more is people saying, actually, we have to work this through now. And we provided a model for that that said, you've got to start, really, with what's your purpose. Uh, and the same is true for every industry. You know, what is your purpose as an ASP? What is your purpose as an air traffic control agency? What is your purpose as a vendor? In the airport context, you know, we saw a spectrum from, on the one hand, being the bus stop to being the major hub and a mini city that provided everything that a city would provide to being an extension of an existing city. There are different functions that airports play. And you've got to really understand that. Once you understand that, you can think about the kind of infrastructure you need to put behind to make that happen. Uh, you can think about how you're going to make the money to keep that operating. That money's going to come from your customers, whether it's the airlines or the passengers. So you've got to think about how you're going to engage them going forward, how you're going to deliver service to them, and then how you go to whoever funds you to say, here's the investment I need to back up this strategy. That consistent model we're seeing being applied to more and more organizations because it allows you to challenge all sorts of decisions that people want to make and say, well, hang on, you're talking about the making a kind of investment that is completely inconsistent with our strategy. Why would we do that? So it's forcing us to be really rigorous in how we make decisions. We also know from our research that the best organizations, those who don't get surprised by the future, 
think on three different time horizons. Firstly, they're very clear on what they're trying to do in the next 12 months. New systems, new strategies, new approaches to pricing, whatever it is, they're very clear on where they want to get to in 12 months' time and what they think will impact the 12-month horizon. Secondly, they also have a, a three-year outlook. You know, what's coming? Maybe we're going to change core systems. Maybe we're going to change the way we price. Maybe we're going to merge. You know, what are those things that we think we want to try and do on a three-year horizon? And again, what are the external factors that could affect that? The very best organizations also have a radar. They're looking out four to 10 years plus to say, what could be coming down the road? So if we're building plans, what could shape those? What could affect us from outside? What are the scenarios as well? Not just one set of forecasts, but what are three or four different scenarios about how the game could play out? And that's really important because I look, a lot of the research we did in preparation for this showed strategies that were going out to 2020, 2025, 2030 and beyond. You can't just talk about those strategies within your own ecosystem. You have to look at the world you're moving in and how it might be impacted. And that's a lot of what I'm going to talk about. The really important thing here, though, is that as a management, you allocate different people to each of these time frames. Because what we've seen is those people who are really good at putting together and delivering the one-year plan are normally almost genetically incapable of doing the kind of four years plus blue skies thinking. They're not just different people, they're different species. <laughs> and so understanding that is really important and understanding how you work with these different timeframes in your management is very important, that you never lose sight of the important long-term stuff due to urgent short-term crises or whatever. We also see a whole bunch of strategic challenges that are coming, and these aren't sort of woo-woo, you know, fancy ideas of something that hasn't happened yet. These are all born in signs of what we can see changing right now, the weak signals that are appearing that are, if you like, creating our challenges for the future. The first of which, obviously, is economic, and you've heard talk of this already. Uh, we know that today the rich economies of the world have a debt of more than 100% of their GDP. We know that personal debt is its highest level ever in the world. Uh, we know that the last financial crisis was triggered by subprime mortgages. Subprime mortgages are an example of what's called derivatives contracts. Today, the estimated value of derivatives contracts is three quadrillion dollars. Quadrillion is one up from trillion. <laughs> to put that in context, the global economy is only 70 trillion dollars. So we're talking about many, many multiples of the global economy. In this area, which isn't even traded on markets, derivatives contracts aren't on any exchange. So we have this ticking time bomb. We know there are all sorts of faults in the global economy. We know there are inevitable recession shocks, problems to come. We know that people are rethinking, you know, how does the global economy work? How does a financial system work? How do political systems work in a very different world? All of this change is sort of unique. It's never happened before in history that all of this is going on at the speed at which the internet makes it possible to communicate it. Which is why when the world leaders get together at the G20, about the only thing they can now decide on a consistent basis is whether to have chicken or prawns for lunch. We're entering new territory. We have no rule book for how this is played out. One of the things we, do, we know will happen though is competition will increase. The pressure on governments to take away the barriers to trade, take away the barriers to investment, take away the barriers to economic growth will increase. If you know, you're either, as air traffic controllers, air navigation services, you're either gonna be positioned as part of the solution or part of the problem. And the question is how you respond to this. At the same time, we are seeing people coming along developing solutions that sit completely outside governments and basically saying we no longer need governments to do this. One of the best examples right now is digital currency, things like Bitcoin. There are 20 different digital currencies at least out there now. These sit outside any system, they're not regulated, but we're seeing more and more being transacted in them. In Dublin this week, at the end of this week, all of the world's major financial institutions have a conference in town looking at the kind of innovations going on in the use of Bitcoin in financial services. We're seeing transformation happen. 
Uh, the UK government is being challenged right now by one of our clients who's a property consultancy, and they're trying to do a property transaction in the UK financed entirely in Bitcoin. The UK government is nervous because the client can't tell them who the purchaser is, where they come from, or where the money came from. Three minor challenges, if you like, in the world of money laundering. Uh, but we're going to see more and more of this. We're going to see uh, you know, our world being challenged, all of the bases on which we, we based our assumptions being challenged in our world, which is why you have to think in scenario terms. You can't just make one set of forecasts, one set of assumptions. We have to think in terms of a two to three to four different scenarios for how things can play out and make sure you've rehearsed the future. You've thought about those different scenarios and you've got strategies that are resilient across a range of scenarios and options you might play at, pursue depending on how things play out you know, from extreme scenarios to extreme scenario. We also know that you know, we've heard already there is this big shift of wealth and power to the emerging markets. The really interesting thing now is that literally 60% plus of the growth in every economic sector from construction to financial services to consumer electronics, 60% or more is expected to come from this handful of countries. This is where the game is going to be played out in terms of economic growth. We also know that we've been used for a long time to talking about globalization as a sort of one-way process. The West taking its stuff to the developing world and making money from it. That game is changing really fast because now we're seeing solutions that were developed by local players for local markets being exported back to the rest of the world. So the $10 insurance policy, the $25 laptop, the $2,500 car, all solutions developed for so-called emerging markets that are now working their way back into the West because people are struggling with their incomes and living standards and finding these quite, things quite attractive. So the rate of turbulence in the world, the level of turbulence, the rate of change is only likely to increase. We also know that there is now cutthroat competition, not just between companies, but between regulators, between governments. The range of factors on which we're trying to compete is just growing and growing and growing. Uh, and that competition will only increase in the next decade or so. At the same time, we know that in the commercial world, the response to that is to pursue disruptive innovation, to, do, to pursue innovations that are truly game-changing. Uh, so one of the biggest disruptors we'll see in the next few years is the emergence of driverless cars, cars where you not, do not have to touch the steering wheel. Google have driven more than a million miles in their driverless vehicles. Now you're thinking, hang on, Google, they do, you know, that's, the, that's where I find out, you know, where the cheapest flight is for my holidays. But Google are now in everything because they have viewed almost every industry now as an information management problem. And how do you do it? How do we bring those skills of information management and network management to any industry? They believe, well, they, they've driven their drive, they've created their driverless vehicles. Uh, now the only thing holding back putting driverless vehicles on the, world around the, on the roads around the world is the insurance industry and the regulators. Because if you, if you buy a driverless vehicles, the instructions are get into your car, do not touch the steering wheel, start doing your text messages. <laughs> or, or, you know, read the newspaper, do whatever. So if you have an accident, it can't possibly be your fault. You have the phone records to prove you were talking to your partner. <laughs> it's a product failure. So instead of insuring 10, 20, 30, 100 million drivers in a country, the insurance industry is only going to be insuring between 10 and 100 car manufacturers. The insurance industry has not word one of a clue as to how to assess that risk or how to price it. And it is that inability to think it through that's holding back this, this innovation. But if we got driverless vehicles on the road, we'd have a lot less deaths because we'd have a lot less accidents. We'd have much more fuel efficient travel. We'd need less resources. We'd change the whole way we think about infrastructure projects. We'd, we'd have a much smarter, cleaner environment. We wouldn't need all the clutter of road signs because the cars would talk to each other and talk to the infrastructure. And this is one of those big beneficial changes to come. But it, it's the environment that's preventing this innovation happening. And, and the real challenge now is how governments get this and how the insurance industry gets it. 
One of the most exciting things we see happening is in the pursuit of disruptive innovation, people saying, actually, we're going to go outside the normal marketplace, the normal players in the industry, the vendors to the industry, the researchers for the industry. We're going to go right outside and see who out there might have ideas that can help us. Uh, two of my favorite examples, one is in uh, UAVs. DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency in the US, has done a public sourcing of spy, uh, spy um, UAVs. Basically, things that will fit in a backpack. They didn't want to go to the existing players, but they didn't want to go to the normal price points. They just said anyone who wanted could compete for this prize. I think it was a million dollars. And they got thousands of participants coming up with ideas. Totally different ways of doing this than they would have expected. And you're seeing this happen now in the satellite world. Uh, NASA has had a satellite contest. Its SkySat um, project is to make it possible for anyone who wants to to create a satellite. The, the target price is about $3,500. You look at SkyCube, the, the one on the bottom of your screen, that's a project uh, that was funded through crowdsourcing, going onto the internet and saying, I want to raise money to build a small footprint satellite. Uh, SkyCube launched its first satellite in January this year. You and I can communicate with that satellite, send messages via, via our mobile phone. They raised the money, they raised more than their target. If you go onto Kickstarter, which is one of these platforms where you can put an idea up to raise money, you'll see at least eight different projects that have been raising money on there, from a water-powered satellite to satellite kits you can make at home. The game is changing. The notion of who owns satellite space is changing. Google have hundreds, if not thousands, of balloons that they can launch out for communications. Major telecoms companies are putting satellites up there. Players in almost every sector are now talking about creating new communication sectors. And the, the consumerization of this means that literally anyone within a couple of years will be able to create a satellite for less than $100. Uh, we've talked about nano satellites. We're down to the femto satellites in terms of size, things weighing 10 grams. Various players in the innovation space see this idea of literally plastering the skies with these networks of satellites that can be used then to transform any sector. And you're seeing people realizing that they have capabilities that can come into your space. Um, we, we, um, you know, the ADSB, is it called? Uh, your communication net, um, model that talks about communicating to a plane twice a minute, oh, sorry, twice a second, see where it's going. Uh, on the plane coming from London to Dublin yesterday, I got talking to someone. She is the marketing director for a network in the, telecommun in the telecommunications network for the financial services market. They can poll 5,000 shares, the price of 5,000 shares, in 20 different markets, 20 times a second, in order to run their exchange. They're one of the fastest networks around at the moment. I was talking to her about this. She said, no, we never thought of that market. How long do you think it would take for us to take it over? <laughs> you're seeing people coming along. They don't know it's not possible to do what you're telling them they can't. They have capabilities. They're coming at it from a different space. And crowdsourcing is a way of people raising the money to do this now who would never have got into your space. We also know that society is changing. Today, if you live in a so-called developed economy and you're under 50, there is a 90% chance that you're going to live to 100 if you're over, over 50, I wouldn't be making so many 50-year-plus plans. Uh, the 90% chance our kids will live to 120. But that's nothing, because our life expectancy is going up five months a year, each time they, they rebase the estimates. And we're seeing a lot of research going on on increasing life expectancy dramatically, looking at different species. So far, the most successful has been with a fruit fly. Uh, now you say a oh, fruit fly only lasts for a day, so who cares? But they've been able to extend the life of the fruit fly 10 times. The basic science is that you under identify the protein that controls aging. Proteins are the building blocks of our genes. They believe they found the same protein in humans and that we could get a three to five times increase in human life expectancy. How do you motivate a 190-year-old air traffic controller? <laughs> What do you buy your life partner for their 200th birthday? <laughs> and think about marriage. No way. No way. 
right? Some of us struggle with a deal that lasts 60 years. <laughs> Imagine saying yes, and it binding you together for 120 plus. Would we make divorce compulsory after 30 years just to keep the murder rate down? We're entering really new territory. But we're also seeing, and so you know, how we service those people, how we handle them in the workplace when we've got people aged 18 to 80, big challenges for our organizations, how we work with them. We also know that the game is changing in terms of the developing world and access to skills. Free education, whether it's the Khan Academy or these massively open online courses being offered by all the major universities, are changing the way the game is played now, the way you can access education. So now you're seeing 18-year-old Mongolians getting the highest marks on degrees from MIT who would never normally have been able to go to that university, and they're getting it for free. And you're seeing not just tens of thousands, but hundreds of thousands of people accessing these skill sets, these, these education programs. So we're, we're transforming the access to education, which is going to transform the economic opportunity in various places. I think two of the biggest challenges you face right now is the perception of risk and how you manage it in a fast-changing world. And one of the risks you need to think about is the risk of inaction, the risk of delaying decision-making. So you get caught trying to make decisions today about whether you should implement a generation of technology that's already out of date by the time you've made the, gen the decision. And the pace of change is increasing. The other is about environmental sustainability. The International Energy Authority tells us in order to achieve climate change targets and CO2 reduction targets, we have to leave two-thirds of all known carbon resources, oil and gas, we have to leave two-thirds in the ground. Now, I don't know about you, but I cannot imagine any owner of that level of natural resources going, yeah, that's fine, I'll just leave all that oil in the ground, I'll leave all that gas in the ground. No one's going to do it. So we know we're, we're not going to make the progress we need to on carbon. We know as a result of that, the airline industry is going to come under increasing pressure and scrutiny to drive its environmental performance. We know they're going to blame you. They're going to say, we can't drive down our performance because air navigation services don't let us fly in the most efficient manner. If only you'd let us use the way we do it the way we want to do it, we'd do it much smarter. So we know this is you know, one of those inevitable truths that's coming. So we, we have to expect that the environmental issues will get worse, and no one will want to take responsibility for not dealing with their part of it. They'll pass the blame on to whoever they can. We also know that cities are becoming the new story, the new economic engine. And the really exciting thing is there are major cities emerging which are going to become very important from a trade perspective. But those cities, you know, take places like Dhaka or, you know, uh, second-tier cities in China and third-tier cities and, and second-tier cities in Africa. These are going to have 10, 20 million populations, but they're not going to have the same kind of infrastructure or capability. And one of the challenges is collectively, if you want to have global airspace you know, managed in a single way, how are we going to make sure they have the capabilities to deliver a seamless global air navigation service, both on the ground and up in the air? We also know that from a commercial perspective, technology is changing the game. The pace of automation is accelerating. Uh, you've seen people like Foxconn in China uh, who, used to, who, make, um, who assemble smartphones and tablets and things. Uh, a few years ago, they had a whole bunch of suicides. One of their solutions is they're buying one million robots to basically eliminate humans from everything. We can see that robots are entering the workforce all over the world now. Uh, it, uh, SoftBank in Japan have just launched a robot for less than $2,000, which actually understands human emotions, that can communicate uh, as though it was almost genuinely artificial intelligence. There's a restaurant in China that you see on the end of the screen uh, where the robots take your order, they cook your food, and they serve it and take the plates away afterwards. The only role for the humans is to keep the robots happy, uh, to clean them. Uh, and the robots don't take breaks. Uh, there's been some great research done by some academics in Oxford who have looked at different skill sets and said, to what extent could robots, artificial intelligence, just smart software, replace them? You'll see that they say there's more than a 50% chance of pilots being replaced. Uh, I was at an event with Charles Bolden, the NASA administrator, earlier this week uh, in Seattle. And one of the things, uh, he talked a lot 
about robotic pilots. And he talked about robots you know, being very prominent, smart software being very prominent in this environment of the future, this idea of very smart skies where you, you know, the planes navigate in trains effectively to get to different destinations, start to coordinate themselves. That's all artificial intelligence. That's all a very smart level of technology uh, that's coming. And so we, we see there are big changes afoot. One of the interesting issues we're, we're already working on with some organizations is how do you work in an organization where you've got three types of employee now? Humans, humans who've enhanced themselves in some way, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and robots and smart software, where the robots might be managing the others. Because the robots are working all the time, and therefore they have much more experience and faster learning than the humans. Now, you guys might think this isn't going to happen. This is happening right now. This, I, uh, one of the things I, I think is really interesting is the shift in attitudes I see around the planet. So I start in Europe, and people here tell me why they don't like an idea, or why it might take too long, or why we can't do this, or they, you know, the, the technology's not ready yet. I'll wait until somebody's doing it. I'll wait until I see it in the marketplace, until the customer demands it. I get to the Middle East. They say, who's doing that? How do we get it here? Where do I invest? I get to Hong Kong, and people say, right, have you got time tomorrow? Because uh, you said some very interesting stuff about robotics. Can I take you to my hospital where I can show you robots already starting to do patient care? That shift in attitude towards technology and how we deploy it, leaving aside the moral and ethical issues, we just see the pace of change moving very dramatically and the locus of innovation shifting. We also see that there is a really transformative role emerging for technology in our organizations. And you've heard already about leveraging people's skills, innovation to differentiate yourselves, cut, you know, changing your processes. We think the most interesting area here is something you might call collaborative decision making. We talk about the hive mind. Bringing together the knowledge of people in multiple organizations to make decisions in real time and increasingly using technology to make that happen, where you talk about potentially having uh, your intelligent agents, your software agent, representing you to make the first round of decision making. In an intelligent way saying, here's a situation. How have you dealt with this on the past five to 500 occasions? So what are the likely ways in which you'd respond to it now? And let's communicate to the other intelligent agents and work out what the solution is. Now, whilst it might take us a, you know, five minutes to a couple of hours to do that with the group of people around the table, the software's doing that in sub-second time. And then putting it in front of the human, saying, we've had a chat. This is what we think you guys would have decided. What do you think? We're moving into that space. And it will change. And you think your environment, air traffic control, is a perfect environment in which to talk about this. So one of the things we think is very important you need to understand is not just what are those technologies that look sexy now and the vendors are telling you about, but do you have a view of the kind of technology that will be coming your way in the next 5, 10, 20 years? Have you sort, thought through how it might impact what you do? From the sort of stuff we see going on right now, and Jeff talked about big data and data mining, and already some of the, you know, the services like Nat Service can predict ahead 18 minutes. So we've already got that kind of stuff happening. Within the next few years, you're going to see more and more use of gesture interface, eye tracking interfaces, voice control. Uh, so in a very sophisticated and complex environment like a, a, an air traffic control center, just enabling the operators to work in, in using multiple senses to control the environment. If we go out 15 years, you're talking about the potential for us to upload our brains to the web. We have to understand these different pieces of technology and how they can uh, impact us. Do you have that picture in your organization of that broad spread of technologies that are coming? You're not going to get everything. We haven't captured everything. We've looked at about 200. If anyone wants that list of 200 technologies and what they are, we're happy to share it. But you know, we know we haven't been perfect. But at least if you have a view of about 80% of what's coming, you can make sure that the decisions you make today aren't blocking out opportunities for the future, aren't creating costly choices in the future. And we see the technology is evolving fastest in the consumer space. So we, you know, we started lives with the desktop. We moved very quickly to luggable, then portable, then mobile. Mobile is interesting because our world has been transformed by the smartphone. 
A smartphone didn't exist seven years ago. Think about the kind of scale of innovation that can happen in the next seven years, uh, given what's changed in the last seven. But it doesn't end there. Because what we see now is this wearable revolution. We're seeing more and more wearable technologies, Google goggles, people wearing all sorts of health monitoring devices, everything imaginable, smart watches. Wearables were being patented three to five years ago, and they're coming to market now. So the question now is, what was being patented in the last three years? And that's embedded technologies. Microsoft already have a, a, a patent on a local area network to go inside your body, to connect the devices inside your body. Uh, already there are millions of people who have pacemakers, who have cochlear implants to improve their hearing, ocular implants to improve their sight. Uh, we get bombarded with innovators coming up with, to us with ideas, things like mo uh, memory implants, so that you can basically have all the, the, the content from your phone in your brain, so when you change the physical handset, you don't have to replace the data. Uh, all sorts of functionality coming. A lot of medical devices to monitor things like stress level, heart rate, blood pressure, uh, to do drug delivery, even to do operative stuff. And we're not talking about 20 years, we're talking about in the next two to three. Think about the challenge this creates for airport security. Today they struggle with people with pacemakers. Imagine something coming with seven or eight embedded devices. There isn't a single security scanning system that can cope with this, and I only know of two airports that have even started to think about this. But it doesn't end here. Because if you look further, again, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency is working on the idea of growing into our brain cells transmitters and receivers, so we can literally upload and download data to our brains. And we know all of this is being connected to what's called the Internet of Things. Literally everything will have a sensor embedded in it, from our clothing to the seats on the plane. Everything will be able to communicate with us. The Singapore courts are looking at the idea of using information from the Internet of Everything in court cases. So I might say, I wasn't at the scene of the crime, honestly, uh, my armchair will defend me on this. My armchair will say, I'm sorry, at the time, I have no signal to show he was sat on me. Uh, and my evidence is backed up by the coffee table and the TV. You know, we are entering a really interesting space where literally 100 billion plus objects will be connected to the web within five years. How are you going to handle that data? Jeff talked about big data. We believe organizations that don't know how to manage big data will go out of business. It will kill them because they'll drown in their own data. Learning now, recruiting the skills, knowing how to use your data to make smart decisions, to do predictive and analytics will be key. And it may be one of those reasons that drives you to outsource. I don't know. We also know the internet is becoming much more multi-sensory. So you'll be able to feel all sorts of sensations, particularly important for people interested in gaming. But actually, the more we understand about human senses, we might be able to tap into that to give air traffic controllers a, a much deeper understanding of 3 and 4D space. Uh, so when they're making decisions, we tap into it. But at a kind of commercial level, this is going to change a lot of industries. Because already, uh, experiments have shown that you can give people touch, taste, and smell sensations via you know, triggering electronic stimulus in the brain. So you'll be able to taste the food in the hotel, feel the bed linens, and smell the bath products when you're deciding where to stay on a holiday but all sat by your desk. Uh, we're talking about real disruption of industries. Artificial intelligence, I already talked about, is here. Uh, the, the sort of things that you need for that coordinated network of planes flying in the sky, communicating with each other, is very close. Uh, you're seeing IBM have created a computer called Watson. Watson can outperform cancer doctors in diagnosing, patient, uh, diagnosing cancer patients because it can take your symptoms and compare them to every case on record and see which is the best fit and most likely cause and the best care plan for you. At the other end of the spectrum, McDonald's can tell you with 80% accuracy what you're going to order as you drive into a McDonald's simply based on what car you're in. We're seeing AI into every single walk of our lives and it will become the heart and soul of, of air traffic and air navigation systems in the future. 
I've already touched on collaborative decision making. You're going to see a lot more use of it to do this kind of collaborative decision making and pooling the knowledge of multiple experts in different organizations to make real time decisions. And so, what we're really seeing is that whole boundary between what we used to think of as magic and what science is making possible. They're, they're blurring those boundaries. Uh, and we're entering this era where biology is becoming the next revolution. Uh, so today, you can already go to a website called 23andMe. You, can, you send them a saliva sample. Eight weeks later, you get back a map of your personal genetic profile. It will tell you across about 250 traits, things like what drugs and, and what food are positively negatively indicated for you, how long you might live, your chances of getting conditions like Alzheimer's in later life. This information is less than $100. Within a couple of years, it will be another app on your iPhone. You'll go, into the, you know, you'll go to the food counter here at lunch. You'll wave your, food, your phone over the food description, and it will say, put that back. It's got sugar in it. You're diabetic. The phone will take over your, your, your um, using your biological information, will start to take over life management. But we're seeing some really big game-changing projects. Google's biggest game changer for the future is the idea of uploading your brain to the web. There are two big projects going on right now, one in Europe, one in the US, to map the human brain, to map how we store information. Not how we think and our creativity, but just how we store information. And uh, Google's goal is that once that's done, they'll upload your brain to the web. Think about it. Google see that you haven't used some aspects of your memory for six months. If you're lucky, they may come back to you and say, do you mind if we delete this? It seems to be un unnecessary. Uh, but you know, if you have an idea, someone else sees it and commercializes it, you could make money literally in your sleep from your ideas. We're talking about opening up a whole new range of possibilities. This stuff will happen, or is expected to happen, faster than some of your next gen systems will be in place. Are we talking, are we factoring in those kind of possibilities into our scenario thinking? At the same time, right now, we see massive advances in terms of enhancing basic human functionality. And this will only grow. Uh, So-called smart drugs, nootropics. Today, already, 90% of students in some universities admit to using drugs like Ritalin, which is for attention deficit disorder, and modafinil, which is for sleep disorder. They're using those drugs to enhance their concentration and performance. The US military gives those drugs to pilots to en enhance their concentration on bombing missions and surveillance missions. So they, they literally block out every other thought other than what they're doing. So we're already seeing people using this stuff. We're also seeing that physical enhancement happen. Today, you can go to Touch Bionics in Scotland and have a replacement body part that is more functional than the one it's replacing. I saw a guy recently who could rotate his hand through 360 degrees. People are now going to them and saying, this arm's perfectly fine, but I want a better one. I want the fingers to rotate. I want faster reaction times. We're entering a space now where people are already enhancing themselves. At the genetic level, within rats and mice, they've been able to identify the genes responsible for anger, for rage, and for obesity. Within five years, treatments will be available to knock those genes out. People will be presenting themselves to employers around the world saying, employ me, look, it says here on my CV that I can never get fat or angry. How are you going to handle a workforce where people are enhanced and some people are capable of working faster and smarter, longer than others, uh, and can prove it? You know, how are we going to manage that workforce in a different way? And we're going to see all sorts of different enhancements coming. So our basic workforce will change quite dramatically in the next 10 years. And what, this, you know, what we can see is science is throwing up all sorts of new sectors that are going to change our world. If you walk through any airport today, you will see signs from HSBC uh, about the future. One of them says, in the future, cities will be grown, not built. And what they're talking about is various projects to use fast-growing algae and fast-growing trees to actually grow buildings. Uh, there are various projects around the world already doing this, so that your, natural, your physical environment becomes part of your natural environment, not in competition with it. And as the environmental pressures grow, you're going to see this stuff move faster and faster. Thin film electronics. This is going to change revenue models in all sorts of industries. Basically, thin film displays, paper displays, will change the way we deliver newspapers. 
we're working with some car manufacturers to look at putting these on the side of cars so that they can become continuous advertising services. And then if you, walking past a car, get a personalized ad to you, because we can identify you from your phone, and you make a purchase from something you see on an advert, we also get a revenue kickback from that. The car manufacturers, some of them believe that they could actually give the car away and pay for it through the advertising revenues. We also know 3D printing. Everyone's seen 3D printing now. We're printing everything from blood vessels to entire houses. But what's really interesting is what comes next, which is 4D printing, four-dimensional printing. Printing objects that change their shape over time. MIT have a lab working on this. So think about planes. Uh, we know from the aeronautics engineers what they would really love is for the, plane, the wings to change the way they present in the air as they go through different levels of the atmosphere to change the drag coefficient. 3D printing will give us that. Objects that can change their shape over time. We're also seeing advances in nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, and the cognitive sciences coming together so that we'll create materials with memory, body panels on cars that will actually reshape themselves after the accident. And finally, atomically precise manufacturing. This is literally the idea of instead of taking a big block of steel and cutting it away to make something, literally assembling it atom by atom. This could be with us by 2030. Again, it will revolutionize manufacturing. Really, for, for nations, what we see is that big science has become the battleground. It's the area where nations think they've got to compete. And we know that big science throws off all sorts of great benefits. So you're, you know, in your world, the space race has thrown off all sorts of benefits into society. Perhaps the biggest one now that we can see is all the science around enhancing humans. And the biggest one within that is a project run by a Russian billionaire called Dmitry Itzkov. His goal is to create immortality by 2045. He's assembled a bunch of eminent uh, Nobel Prize winners and scientists to make this happen, a four-stage process. The first stage is that by about 2017, he wants you to be able to control your robot with a brain-computer interface. So you would have your robot out there doing your work for you. Uh, you already can buy these brain-computer interfaces that you can control the computer without touching the keyboard. You would control your robot doing that. The Japanese professor who's driving this is putting robotic teaching assistants into Japanese schools next year. The second stage then is, I talked about mapping the brain. By 2025, they hope to be able to upload your brain to your robot when you die. So what you know lives on. The third stage then is they reckon 10 years beyond that will have mapped human consciousness, the mind, how we think, how we imagine, uh, how we have ideas, our creativity. And that again, when you die, by 2035, we'll upload that. And then by 2045, he has this vision that we'll all exist as these holographic beings. Uh, might have a big impact on air travel if you know, we can put 4,000 passengers on an A380. Um, but it's a real challenge. It's in, you, know, you can't really plan for when your workforce are all holographic. But understanding that these game changes are coming and understanding that whilst we're still sitting here thinking, mm, should I upgrade from Windows 7 to Windows 8, these guys are working out how we create immortality. So, you know, there's, there's a kind of scale of difference going on here. And we've got to understand that most of the innovation that will disrupt your world is not going to come from within it. And what we see is all of that innovation is enabling a new generation, if you like, of barbarians who don't know it's not possible. People coming along going, I can disrupt your industry. I can do what I want because you don't listen. Or you're so vested in a view that that's not how it's possible, that can't work here, that I'll come along and do it. Simple example, in the mobile phone world, uh, mobile phone operating companies make a lot of money out of text messaging. Along came WhatsApp. A company of less than 30 employees has changed that industry dramatically by making text messaging possible for free over the internet. They just got sold, I think it's about $18 billion to Facebook, because they're a revolutionary that industry. Those barbarians did not care one word about what the players in the industry thought. What's really interesting is every mobile phone operator we talk to says, oh, we had that idea about five years ago. But the way we work, our internal rules, meant that everyone, you know, we killed the messenger. We told people not to talk about it because it would change the whole way we operate. How many of those internal barbarians are there right now? 
creating the ideas that could totally disrupt your organization, and you're either sacking them, telling them to go and work on something else, or putting them on a two-year feasibility study in the hope that they lose the will to live by the time they finished. Now, I'm sure you never do that, you know, but you know, it's a great management strategy, isn't it? Go and do another report on that. Come back if you've still got the energy. Um, uh, and we see that new ideas are just reshaping every industry. You take the food industry. Food demand globally is going up about 4% a year. Food supply is going up less than 2%. We need radical solutions again. One solution is vertical farming, multi-story farms. Chicago O'Hare Airport already has one. In the UK, we have a, a multi-story farm and a zoo. It produces three times more food than if we farm the land it sits on. But it only uses a fraction of the energy in the water. This is going to transform the food industry. And around the world, people are now building 30 and 40 story vertical farms in the middle of cities right next to where the people are, on top of buildings. All sorts of different ideas coming up. What's really interesting is none of these projects are being led by the food industry. These are being led by innovators from outside who, again, don't know it's not possible. What's the equivalent in your sector? You know, we also know that there's a real focus now on rapid execution. One of the biggest challenges I think you face, and we heard it again from all your speakers today, is how do we speed up decision making? How do we speed up execution so that each generation of decisions doesn't get caught up in the next one and we get so complex that we can never make a decision because you've got 42 different projects you've got to worry about and 50 initiatives and 4,000 regulations and by the time we've written them down, there's another 50, you know. How do we get beyond that? How do we get faster in the way we operate? To me, one of the best examples of this going on in the world right now is in China, a company called Broad Group. Uh, and they could see that if you're building hotels and you get the license to build, and you wait two years to actually complete your hotel, the market can have changed. And so your investment can be wasted. And you make an, a, an investment in this generation of technology to go into that building, and by the time it's finished, you're very confused because people want different environmental management technology or whatever. So they said, how do we change the game in construction? Not just change the rules, but change the game itself. And their view was, how does Lego work? Lego, you have all the basic building blocks, and you just put them together really fast. So they, their model is Lego. In their factories, they assemble prefabricated sections of the building. They put the cabling, the pipe work in, in the building. When they get on site, they just literally plug it all together. They're building a 200-story building right now. You might want to wait for a couple of weeks to go to the hotel on the 50th floor to make sure that, you know, it hasn't become the 40th floor, or you know. <laughs> um, but you know, this is stuff that, and they're doing that in seven months, by the way. Seven months for a 200-story building. What's really interesting is they can build the buildings faster than the lawyers can write the contracts for occupancy. How do we accelerate decision making? How do we get beyond everyone wanting to have their say on every single word, and even when the decision's made, still reserving the right to keep arguing? How do we get to making decisions faster on what our goal is, and then how we get to the goal? Because that's critical for all of us. And you're going to see new paradigms come along that just change this. And at the moment, we have these assumptions that air travel is dominant, you know, uh, that, and that's always going to be the case. You take this, this is Hyperloop from a guy called Elon Musk, the guy behind Tesla, behind PayPal. He's funded the design for this and given it away for free on the web. And basically, it's a tube service a pneumatic tube that would take you from LA to San Francisco in 30 minutes. The estimate is that it will cost one-tenth to build this of what it would cost for the equivalent rail infrastructure. Now, we in the West, we're way too smart to do that. <laughs> we're finding all sorts of good reasons to say it's not possible, largely because all the players in the value chain can't see how they can make money out of it. You look at the players from the developing world, they go, actually, this is brilliant, because we can deliver a lot more infrastructure for our money. So you've got players in China, players in Latin America, players in the Middle East looking at this and saying, can we be the first to build this? Because if we can build one or two of these and prove they work, then we can take that around the world to all those people who are still on their knees having their 45th feasibility study and show them how we can build this before they finish the next feasibility study. All of this also implies that we need new skill sets. Uh, the Institute for the Future did a really interesting piece of work on the skill sets we need for the future. Have a look at that list on the bottom of the screen. How many of those do you have today? 
How many of those are you building into your training programs for your workforce? How many of those are core skills that you think you need or you've got to cope with the kind of changes I've been talking about? We also know that really where all this starts to play out is in your business models, and you've heard talk about that already. And we see the need for business model change at three levels. One is how we fund our assets. We no longer need to own anything. We need to use it. Uh, people are renting computer systems through cloud computing. They're renting physical infrastructure. They're renting their cars by the hour. We no longer need to own stuff. We need to use it. And it gives us a lot more flexibility. It makes, makes us use our money more effectively because we don't have it all tied up in infrastructure. It lets us change generations of technology much faster if we're renting rather than owning. We're also seeing a lot of innovation in terms of how people fund stuff. So I've talked a lot about Kickstarter. The way Kickstarter works is you have an idea, whoever you are, you put it onto Kickstarter, you promote it, you have 45 days to raise your money. And there's lots of platforms like this. This guy wanted to create a wristwatch to plug an iPod Nano into. He wanted to raise $30,000. He raised over 900,000. This is transforming the venture capital industry. Because now venture capitalists will say to anyone with an idea, first go to one of these crowdfunding platforms, see if there are people willing to order your product. If you hit your minimum target, then I'll invest in you because I'm letting the market decide whether you're viable rather than taking the risk before you've touched the market. And we're seeing corporates using this now. We're using people using it to raise funding, people raising infrastructure funding via these platforms, bypassing the investment banks, going straight to the investors. This will change the whole way we fund infrastructure going forward. And then how we make money. This is the most exciting area because you're seeing all sorts of revolutionary ideas or dramatically different ideas about how we actually charge for goods and services. So the engine companies now, Rolls-Royce, Pratt & Whitney, they don't sell engines anymore. They sell power. They charge you for continuous power. They don't charge you for the physical engine. We're seeing Groupon. You've all seen these aggregated buying. But my favorite one, as an example of radical thinking, is the auction model. Because this is a license to print money. How it works is when you make a bid for an item in the auction, the price goes up by one penny but you pay a fee of £1.50 to make your bid. So you can see where we're going on this. I'm selling a £630 TV, 25 seconds to go in the auction. I've had 2,059 bids at £1.50. So whilst my winning bidder is really happy at the moment because they're getting a TV for less than £30, I'm even happier because I'm getting over £3,000 for a £600 TV. And the auction hasn't finished yet. Second one, I'm selling a 614 pound laptop. 26 seconds to go, I've made over 8,000 pounds. But my favorite one is the last one because this is proof that money can grow on trees. I'm selling 125 pounds, four seconds into my auction. I've already made 81 pounds. I will sell that 121 pounds, 125 pounds for between 10 pounds and 50 pounds which means I will get between 1,500 and 7,500 pounds for my 125 pound outlay. Not a bad return on investment. As you start to think to the future, and you've heard a lot about business models, what are those creative business models you're thinking about, those alternative approaches you're thinking about, about charging for your services, about the way you price, the way you make money? Because there is an immense range of creativity. And if you can't do it, Give me the problem. I'll put it to a bunch of 12-year-olds. They will come up with a whole bunch of smart ideas for you. Today, one of the biggest demands in the world is for kids to work on foresight projects. You know, if you want to set up a business, just find a project to get kids involved. Everywhere I go now, they have kids involved in their future thinking projects. Because they, again, don't know it's not possible. They give themselves permission to believe. So really, in conclusion, I've got a few thoughts for you. Are you thinking about what's coming next? Do you have in your organization a function to explore the future on a continuous basis and how it might affect you? Are you thinking and have people responsible for those different time horizons? Secondly, you live in a complex world, but do you celebrate complexity or do you challenge it? Are you on a systematic basis asking people for their to stop lists? What are the things that your staff would stop doing tomorrow if they thought no one would notice? 
the meetings, the reports, the activities that add no value. Having those orgies of elimination creates the opportunity to free up time and thinking space to work on the future. And really, this is a really interesting time for you guys. Because you can either make the choice of saying, you know, we're just like our competitors in this space. We're just like everyone else. What we're scared of, they're scared of. So we either step into it and do the stuff that scares us most and learn from it, or we get consumed by those fears. It paralyzes us, we don't act, and someone effectively just takes the game away from us. Now, I believe that the reason you're here is a quote from Graham Greene, which says there comes a time in everyone's life where you have to open the door and let the future in. I think that door's very firmly open for this industry. I can feel the change happening. I can feel the desire for change. I hope I've just given you a few ideas on what you find on the other side of that door and how you can take advantage of it. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Rohit. I'm not going to attempt to summarize that at all. Um, but uh, we've probably got three to four minutes for questions. If anyone has uh, a question for Rohit, if you want to know your future. Does anybody have any questions? OK, the desire for coffee is obviously something uh, here. Um, we're running a little bit late. Can we please come back at uh, around uh, 10 to? So about 25 minutes for, for the break. OK, enjoy your coffee. Thank you. <laughs>